and welcome to Backlot Banter, a show on Backlog Banter, a channel you should subscribe to if you're not already, where we are talking about movies. This movie in particular being Robert Eggers' The Northman. The oh, yeah. Northman. Viking, the Viking epic of the year of 2022. I am your host, Tanner Dykstra, joined as always by my good friend Tucker Hazel, and as not as always, our resident Viking enthusiast and resident Viking himself, Timo Nelson. Yeah. Ah! Congratulations, ah! Timo. Yeah, ah! yeah. Give, it, give us a good Viking berserker scream. Just yeah! There he is. As, as I said up top, we are talking about Robert Eggers' The Northman here. I filmed that we've all seen. Timo saw it uh, a day before us, I believe. He got mm-hmm. an early screener for that thing. Uh, very jealous of him. But we've all seen it. Uh, I'm going to say full spoilers for this. There's not, yeah. there's not huge plot twists or anything like that. Oh, there's a... There's a fair no- there's there's a, a plot twist in it. There is that a I can, plot twist, yeah. There's, there's some plot there's twist. some plot. But um I'm gonna say full spoilers up top. That's what I'm gonna say. Sure. Well we're not we're not gonna we might give you some warnings, we might not. You you go in by your own discretion. This is the this is the harsh, brutal realities of, of BLB. Same as the harsh brutal realities of Iceland, where this film takes place. Yeah. Of the Northman, yeah. Of the oh, Northman, yeah. yes. Northmanland. Yes. yes. I wanna throw it over to Timo first, since he did see this film first, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it, it is of it, his it's only culture, right. his heritage, of course. So, Timo, what did you think of the Northman? Man, Timo felt a genetic kin towards mm-hmm. these these godforsaken characters. Yes, <laughs> I I did. I really liked the Northman. I man, I love Vikings. Okay, just throwing that out there. I love Vikings. They're awesome. They go do crazy stuff. And guess what? We got to see the Vikings in all of their glory, in their full glory in this episode, or in this movie. Yeah. I don't know why it is an episode, but it, this film, <laughs> man, mm, I, it's, it's a chef's kiss for me in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the depiction of Vikings was just awesome. And I had a really great time just watching and enjoying this film. It, man, mm, man, mm. so many great mm. scenes, so much awesome stuff to think about. I just am kind of a fan of everything that this film puts forward. I don't really... It was not being a super critical viewer when I watched it. It's, it's fine. Just I thought it was just good fun, man. Yeah. yeah. Ultra violent Tucker? Vikings, awesome. We'll go, we'll go clockwise around the horn here, Tucker. What did you think of the Northman? I thought it was quite a bit of fun. I I've, I've been trepidatious to say the least about Robert mm-hmm. Eggers' other films. I was underwhelmed quite a bit by The Witch. Um, mm. I, it's been a while since I've seen it. I might enjoy it more when we watch Who the Fuck Knows. Um, I was un- underwhelmed at first blush by The Lighthouse, though I've since come around to appreciating it for its aesthetic qualities and everything. But this, I feel, is a more... It, it appeals to me a little bit more. It's a little, mm. less, little less poetic, like The Lighthouse is trying <laughs> to be. I don't even really remember what my problems with The Witch were. But I, I found The Northman to be really enjoyable. I don't think there's any particularly large problems with this film. It's it's great on all its filmmaking fundamentals and production value and, and all the acting is very good. Um I think I disconnect a little bit from it because I don't I don't care about Vikings. Like that it's not an aesthetic, it's not a world, it's not a culture that that appeals what? What? <laughs> that, that, that appeals to me on like the guttural instinctual level like Timo Nelson. Mm-hmm. Um but also, the fact that I sometimes had a hard time understanding what they're saying because mm-hmm. there's, yep. there's some heavy accents in this film that makes it a little bit hard to, to pick up occasionally. But otherwise, you know, relatively simple revenge story following a guy. I, I, I had definitely had a good time because it's a very yeah. good movie. Well, we are all in the same Viking warship here because I yeah. also really enjoyed the oh, North. We're all yeah. rowing Viking forward. funeral pyre boat. Yes. We all, we're all rowing in motion at the, at the same pace here because we all really like the, the beat of the same drum. Yes. Uh, I think yeah, the the just the aesthetics of what uh, Eggers does here. You know, this is a bit a step away from his uh, horror stuff in uh, The Witch and even The Lighthouse to an extent. Mm-hmm. And he just goes full bore into this brutal, gory, bloody, dirty Viking aesthetic. Yes. Yeah. And the settings and the costumes and the everything is so immaculate in, in capturing this in capturing this world you, it, you really just disappear into this because you have big stars in this you have Anya Taylor Joy you have uh, Ethan Hawke you have Alexander Skarsgård and you, I I don't feel like I'm watching them. I feel I like didn't I'm even watching. Notice Ethan Hawke, Willem Dafoe, like Nick play. Nicole yeah, exactly. Willem Dafoe is another great example. They yeah. disappear into these roles of you know these uh these uh the, these Viking warriors and royalties of years of years old and th- and things like that. And on a on a, a more filmic level, 
I really enjoyed the characters. Uh, I, I thought that, you know, this is a this is based on a quite an old Icelandic legend, so you're not going to get a lot of intricacy here. But on the base level, I think uh, Skarsgård does a great job in this in this title role in portraying some of the the uh, internal emotions that maybe don't come across in the story itself. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I think it's really fantastic. I love the. I want to get into this a little bit more, but like the fantastical elements that might not be fantastical, you know, yeah. they can be interpreted both ways. I've loved a lot of it, almost everything, I should say. Yeah, there's so many different moments from throughout the film that I just like remember very clearly. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, that just happened. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> let's let's just start off where I think this film shines brightest in in the gore, in just its viscerality. Eggers mm -hmm. knows how to make a film that's really like really grabbing and very intense and and this film when it opens and all what's his name Amun, Omlet, uh, how are you Omlet. 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 Hamlet Hamlet Hamlet's dad gets Hamlet. killed um at the beginning of the movie and we get to just clear as day get to see his head chopped off now mm -hmm. that signaled to me that telegraph was like I know what we're in for. And then you get yeah. noses coming off and horse heads being chopped and arms yeah. being sliced and dudes stabbing themselves in the neck. Man, it's like, oh, so vile. It's so violent. And that's so awesome because it is so violent. Mm. Yeah, I do think that the 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 gore that comes with the amount of violence and brutality, especially that they're showing, is where this movie sets apart from everything else. I mean, we've gotten our we've gotten our period pieces, we've gotten our war movies, we've gotten our movies that are that are set in ye olden days where they're they're herding sheep and dealing with logs or whatever. But I think that putting it in the Viking culture where you're <laughs> able to uh, portray just absolute brutality and like brutality that is covered in like. A, a layer of grime and mud and blood and gore and all this nonsense it, it is the scenes where it leans heavily into those that i think it's at its best and like the aesthetic is is firing at all cylinders and i think the one the, the sequence that stands out most to me um other than the ending battle which i think is is one of the most impressive parts of the film uh is another one of the most part impressive parts of the film is the viking raid that we first mm -hmm. see adult uh, yeah uh, Amla go through um and it's largely one shot and he's doing all these crazy things and there's people coming in and out of frame and and it is it, it's actually quite a bit i think it's the clear inspiration of seven samurai like i was mm. feeling i was watching seven samurai while watching this but like through viking lens through modern modern uh filmmaking sensibilities and it was really really impressive yeah, yeah. that raid uh, scene oh I, i'll let you speak tanner but man yeah. the, the way that we start because I think this movie was pitched a lot on on like Viking acid. Shro the Vikings did shrooms, yeah. believe it or not, um, mm -hmm. to enhance their combat abilities. Basically, they do psychedelics, and as we see in this movie, freak themselves out so that they go into a blind rage, so you know, all encompassing that they can't tell who's their friend and who's their enemy. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that we start at that raid, at the at the raid with Amleth and all the other berserkers, like getting hyped up and you know having done some psychedelics, they're yeah. they're like out of their minds crazy and man that is just like a harrowing scene and the way it starts the camera's like following all of them behind and 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 the the we see the uh the spear get flung off the the, the barricade and he doom and he grabs it out of the air and he spins it around and he throws it back like three times as fast and it just nails the dude and i'm like Ooh, oh yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah, no. so much fun that was what I was gonna bring up. Is that that sequence right there might just be like one of what end up being one of my favorite shots of the year because they use that in the trailer because it is just badass. It's just yeah. fucking awesome. Arsgard grabbing it and just winging it back at the like you said, Debo, like three times as fast because he's hopped up on adrenaline and Viking shrooms and shit like that. And being a Viking, and not and to mention that Viking. Alexander Skarsgård in this film is one of the most. He he is a unit. He is he humongous. Is. It insanely shredded, insanely <laughs> shredded. He looks like a dior a walking diorama for for the human body's muscles. Let's say like everything is <laughs> toned down. There's he's like like negative five percent body fat here. It is insane. Um, it's I, historically I, I, inaccurate. Yeah, historically but... inaccurate, of course, but it looks badass. I will say. Yeah. I don't give a oh, fuck that it's historically <laughs> inaccurate. No, I, I don't want. Either. I'm not saying I if, do. If yeah. my Vikings are not shredded, something's wrong. I don't care sure, that sure. maybe they didn't have the nutritional capabilities to get there in the first place. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I think it's also uh, interesting, you know, I taught and I said this to Tucker last night that, um, that the mountain, uh, from Game of Thrones making an appearance in this film, he's one of the, he's the big opposing, uh, whatever that game is that like, Oh, and that weird, that, yeah. The, the, like the pre lacrosse looking game. Uh, he's the well, big, dude I, as that, I, I said football, but awesome. When yeah. Football, but awesome. Yeah. Uh, he is the, he's the big dude that, uh, Sc- that Skarsgård, you know, uh, you know, duels off against at the very end. Yeah. And, the guy who I, I don't know his real name. It's something I can't probably pronounce. I think he's actually an Icelandic dude. Yeah, yeah. The and, and he played, yeah, the mountain. We're gonna call him the mountain because that's what most people know him as. And that guy's actually literally huge. Whereas Skarsgård, I think you know he's Icelandic, but he's probably like six six one maybe. But they make them look comparable in size in this, which yeah, he is looks I think, good for sixty one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not what I meant, Tucker. You know, you know that's not what I meant. Um, but yeah, I think uh, if we want to talk about Skarsgård a little bit more, I like I said, I think he's fantastic in this. Um, as I talked about, you know, this is based on an Icelandic legend. You don't get a lot of character intricacy or things uh, things of that nature. But I think uh, Skarsgård pulls off uh, what can be done with this story. I think that is portraying a guy who has been corrupted by rage to such an extent that he is. He he has this mission, but he really just lost sight of it over you know the the ten twelve fifteen year time jump that we, that gets taken place here, and he becomes basically the embodiment of rage, which is a Viking berserker mm-hmm, who just yeah. takes drugs and goes in and murders indiscriminately. Um, and you know that it, it isn't until he sort of stumbles upon this way to get back at um Fjolnir. Fjolnir, thank you. you fucking Mus- stupid. He Mus- say, they say that a lot. They say must kill Fjolnir. Must kill Fjolnir. Yes. Uh he, he stumbles across this way to get back to him that he that he's pushed on this plot. And um I think it's really interesting, you know, because he's this 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 vehicle for vengeance for most of the film that obviously he starts developing a relationship with Olga, Anya Taylor Joy. Um and there's a very key moment, which I think is probably the highlight of Skarsgård's performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, towards the end, when they're on that boat, they're heading off, they're heading away from Iceland. Uh, you know, they, he hasn't killed Fjolnir, but he's like, he's fallen in love with Olga, and he realizes that she's pregnant. And that prophecy that he heard at the beginning comes back around. That is, you either you must either live through um, hate for your enemies or kindness for your kin. And he says, I choose both. And as we know, you can't do that. You, it's a, it's a, it's an either or. You know, you can't have both. And the moment you understand that, like, he does want both. That that's clearly something that he has. But this this vengeance, this hate, has been so ingrained into him that he thinks he can have both. But in his subconscious, he's like, "No, nah, I will. I want revenge more." And that's why he goes back. Because if he really did want to, he he could have stayed with Olga and they would have, you know, they sailed off to a different part of the land and he's like, oh, Fjolnir might come for us. Probably not. Like, he, Fjolnir's not in a great position, like, kingdom-wise. Uh, he probably Especially wouldn't have come for them. after yeah. Amleth has gone gone ahead and done his reign of terror upon the, like, yes. the tiny-ass village that he, like, mm-hmm. that he now lives yeah. in. Yeah. I, and, I think the scenario that they build there across the course of the movie, it takes a little bit for me, at least as a viewer, to realize what the what the culture of this story is, what the mm-hmm. little the 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 sheep herding village that they live in, and his role in that, and him being a slave and, and trying to get like all these seeds are planted. But I think it is through the course of the film that they really begin to sprout, and I became very invested in this very surprisingly small scale story. We're mm-hmm. talking about three or four characters in a very small isolated village and it's just revenge and i think mm. it is actually really strong in that simplicity because he he's not a very deep character he's not a very complex character but i think that's okay because what it what it it works because you know that this is a guy who all other sides of his personality have been chopped off leaving only the straight arrow of revenge and mm. hate in yeah. like that's a, that's the only side of his personality by design and i think it's very interesting because of that yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, and obviously, I think that comes uh, comes to roost in many ways in that final super badass battle on like a volcano that you know the literally lake on a volcano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The film sets it up by going like, "You will drown Fjolnir in a fi- in a lake river in, in the lake of fire." And I was like, "Ooh, yeah. oh!" I was like, "Oh, the climax of this movie is going to take place on a volcano, isn't it?" Because yeah, I, I didn't put those two together. It had shown well, them earlier. It showed- volcano quite a few mm-hmm. times but and like, i was just like i didn't put the two together i uh, was just was i was waiting for it i was like oh we're 
you know, as he was sitting on the boat going away, I was like, oh, but he, but he hasn't gone to the volcano yet. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but the lake of fire. Where's the lake of fire? And then yeah. it comes and I was like, yeah. And it was unbelievable. Oh, that scene is, that is an insane fight sequence. They step over yeah. the lava. They go multiple yes. times. Yeah. 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 Um, but there's a moment in that fight when uh, Amleth gets his arm, you know, a pretty deep Shwing. cut in his arm uh, from, from Fjolnir. Mm-hmm. And he like sits there for a little bit and you get, you can see the inner machinations of his mind working. this like, I have my, my entire life has been leading up to this moment. I cannot, I cannot let him win. I, I must complete my mission, uh, my, at least one of them, that is kill Fjolnir. Because as we know, and as we'll get into, he did not exactly save Mother. No, uh, no. I guess, I, I suppose he did avenge Father in some respects. Um, but yeah, and then that obviously leads him to, I did, did, he beheads Fjolnir at the very end, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, a, in, a, in the great shot Why of the two of them. The heart. Yeah, it's up the heart. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and a shot that's yeah. reminiscent of of some uh, lighthouse shots. I really liked how that scene pans. Ve- is a very lateral scene. It moves back and forth, left to right, in a very flat mm-hmm. plane. Even though there's a lot going on, it's, in- it's a fighting game. It's yeah. a fighting game sequence on on a fighting game level that happens to be a volcano. <laughs> and I think mm-hmm. it works really well because you know this sequence is beautifully shot. Well, surprise, surprise. So is the rest of the movie. I think this is. Yeah. A very, really, really good cinematography, and I'm feeling like I'm discovering what Edgar's cinematography style is. I think it is these long takes and this camera that just really moves around and yet shows us all of what we want to see, all of the gore and the violence, as well as important elements here. Yeah, but mm-hmm. who cares about those though? I want to no, see. No, no, no. I want to see blood and guts and stuff, dude, sp- with his bowels spilling out. Aside oh of- yeah, the guy that walks into the house. He's Jesus just like, Christ. and all, all the tubes come out. And of course, I, one of the course. most shocking moments of the film when mm-hmm. he stabs the guy through his cut off nose. And, yes. and oh my God. That, that, that is, is you, know, we, you know, modern audiences pretty desensitized to violence. Just That's just kind of the way that it, that it exists. But, and you really have to go, you, you know, how it be and how it do and how it is. Um, but you really have to go above and beyond and, and think of something that is that is really, really just really depraved. It is, creative. It, it is creative in how in, in what in what you have to create in something so brutal. And the idea of you set up this character, this I don't even know what this guy's name is, but mega uh, our, mega side Hamlet character cuts off his nose at the very beginning, beginning, which is brutal in itself. Yeah. But as soon as he runs back. And he's like, "Oh, uh, Fjolnir, I, I, the kid escaped." And you, and you see his his nose stub bleeding. I'm like, "That guy's coming back, and he's gonna have no nose." And then, of course, you know, he's a That's sort of right, he's sort of this right hand man for Fjolnir. And his final fate is Amleth pins him up against the side of a, the house, takes his his ult, his super badass death night blade right into his nose hole, and just pushes through. And his hand, his like his hands are twitching as his like brain is being impaled. It is nuts. That's how like you're Crazy. supposed to kill fish after you catch them. <laughs> and so to see that like ooh, it was one of those moments where I'm looking up at the screen in the theater and I'm like, I'm like, oh that's so gross. That's so <laughs> like nasty. And I just, I'm like I'm not. No way am I looking away. I have to watch this. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few elements that I do want to talk about. Uh, we haven't talked about Nicole Kidman, mother at all. Uh, Queen, Queen Nicole Kidman. I don't know where her character name is. <laughs> um, but I, well, I, frankly, let's be real. Fjolnir and Olga are the only like very clear true. names that yes. they're consistently saying that sound pronounceable to us. Um, Ethan and, Hawke is sometimes referred to as War Raven, which is pretty tight. That's true. I don't, I don't yeah. know that, but sure. Um, but uh, Nicole Kidman, she, she has you know. she has the character twist that I alluded to at the top of the at the top of the big show. spoiler coming right. Yeah, now. big spoiler. So we we will give you a warning here. In Essentially that, actually the only spoiler of the movie, except for the fact that he dies. At the yeah, end. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Um, Which we already but, talked about. So if you're sorry, this, yeah. Um, so, you said spoilers anyway. I, we don't need. Yeah, to I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just uh, anyway. The Nicole Kidman twist is is that obviously she um d- d- lured Fjolnir into into killing Ethan Hawke, Ethan War Raven Hawke. Yeah, uh, she is the puppet master, the yeah, the the, fig- the shadowy spring. figure behind everything that happened in the, yeah. in the in the prologue for the film. Um, yeah, 
I think and she's like, actually, your uncle's tight and he's cool. And he like and he's, he, he's like, he doesn't treat me as a, a woman slave and use me as as he pleases. He's actually a good guy. And, and, and like, maybe he like, loves no, me. No, no, no. I, I do actually think that that is the most interesting part of the movie. Mm-hmm. I think that it's not the strongest part of the movie, which is, is the brutality, is those violent sequences. But in terms of storytelling and how that reframes a lot of the narrative, it makes the whole thing it way more interesting because mm. up until that point revenge story yeah that's yeah. about it like, he, yeah. he's got a he's got a girlfriend uh, yeah okay he's, yeah, he's yeah. Funny, whatever but but learning that not only is his mother who we just thought was you know a, a side piece female character in this film mm. the one that's been in control the entire time and that his father was not the man that he thought he were, yeah. was to be and yeah. that this entire nor um, revenge narrative nor was he the film narrative yeah, well, well, and that 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 it, uh, Ethan Hawke was not that not the man that we were shown he was because we were shown him essentially through Amleth's eyes. Sure, yeah, especially because he was a child. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, re- framing all that re- reframes his revenge narrative. It's like, oh, this is all built up under the pretense of a lie because up to this point, like he's a vengeful guy, he's violent. Like in modern day, that would not fly. Mm-hmm. But in terms of this culture and the way that he's raised with the Willem Defoe, with Willem Dafoe's character being like, you, you literally have to do this or like, you're going to go to Viking hell or whatever. Uh, <laughs> like all, all this stuff, you're like, okay, well it makes sense that he's doing this, but the fact that it's built up under the pretense of a lie makes it a lot more conflicting. And then mm-hmm. even more uh, emotionally investing when he does end up making the choice to leave Olga and, end his mm-hmm. life by com- by completing his quest i think they're there that's like that that causes like the only real emotional weight of the film but it's, it's there's a good, that very good moment. there's that i don't know how long it is period from the relevation the twist until while, while we're with olga that i really i think is is very strong and is very emotional there's like this like reckoning where he's like do i yeah. really want revenge do i really want what i'm what i've been going for and what i've already taken so many steps towards and there's like, there's the, I had the very real feeling. I was like, oh, is he going to turn away? I was like, is yeah. he going to like just say, oh, forget it. We're going to go live in, in the, whatever the Falkland islands. Are. No, that's in South America, wherever the Orkney islands. That's, that's right. Quite, that'd be quite the journey. <laughs> <laughs> the Vikings were in the Falklands. Oh my God. Don't yeah. tell Margaret Thatcher that one. Um, <laughs> but the, the, I don't get that joke. There was a someday, someday young Tucker. Someday. Well, that's a different movie. Um, there's that moment where he's really deciding and really very, very conflicted. And I feel like I saw that play out and I really felt it while I was watching it. And yeah, that is a great character beat. And I think it really, it makes you think back in that scene where Nicole Kidman is spilling the, the truth, I guess, maybe, who knows? She could not be telling the truth, whatever. doesn't matter. Um, that I am going back and thinking through all the different bits of the plot. I'm like, oh, uh, what? No way. Yeah, huh? exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the reframing that I was talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. It's great. Uh, uh, the, one th- the thing that I want to talk about that I think also heightens my enjoyment of this is I, I, I don't have a particular connection to Vikings, as I said, but what I do like is, and, you know, this review is going up before the review I'm about to talk about, but our Birdman review, I talked about how I like when films lean into some sort of heightened reality. And yes. the fact that there are just, there are just touches of magic in this mm-hmm. film. And, uh, and, not and just the fact magic, that, though. What? Norse Viking, Viking magic, Norse oh, mythology. Sure, mythology. Oh, the mythology is super awesomely represented here. Yeah, but that, that's what I mean. Of course, the magic mythology, oh, the, the same sides of the same coin. Doesn't even matter. Uh, but the fact that we've got um, ravens showing up out of nowhere to help mm-hmm. him, and we've got this these the messengers uh, portrayals of, Odin. of exactly yeah, yeah. Or, or his father, you know, ravens, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and the portrayal of his family tree through through this really cool visualization. And of course, I think one of the coolest things is when he uh, gets a side quest from an NPC, yeah. <laughs> drops down into the Elden Ring dungeon, defeats the mini boss, and gets a oh, legendary cool. blade. <laughs> and like, it literally sounds like it could be an Elden Ring like mini it boss. Actually yeah. It actually does. It should yeah. be. because The a- whole sequence is an Elden Ring dungeon. <laughs> yeah. What an uh, awesome... It's great. It's an awesome yeah. sequence. Awesome And he sequence. gets a blade that can only be unsheathed at night. Why? Yeah. Who knows? But that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it, exactly. It kind of matters later. There's a moment where some other sure. dude has the sword and he's like, it will work. Sure. And then he just throws yeah. it aside and you're like... It's no guy. You're like, you're yeah. fucking dumb. Yeah, those guys trying to get it open. 
Um, Tucker, the the fantastical elements that that may or may not be real, because as we were talking about, Vikings are always tripping out on all sides of psychedelics. They start um, them young. I, I was like, that's I was, true. I was like, hmm, what is doing mushrooms oh, when you're like full, like what, however old MF is, yeah, like ten or eleven or whatever. That yeah. really messes with your brain yeah, permanently. Probably. That like really fucks you up. That might be why he uh may- maybe hallucinated potentially the whole uh interaction with with the with the mound dweller and of course you know it cuts around to the end and he just grabs the sword from the guy so could be real could be not up to your interpretation both are cool. both interpretations rope. Uh, cool yeah one. exactly both interpretations are cool um but the fantastical elements are a great avenue to talk about um Olga Anya Taylor Joy because she is this. She is the uh, uh, a, a witch of the forest. I think she calls herself at some points. Something of the Birchwoods. Yeah. Yeah, because um, she's a Slav. She's a Slavic because the film takes place in the Rus. And if you can't guess where that is, I got nothing to test, nothing to say to you. Mm, the Rus. <laughs> um, but no, I think Anya Taylor Joy is also great. Obviously, she plays second fiddle to Skarsgård here. Um, she does. Her character doesn't have a lot to do, but in portraying this sort of like heightened reality, she has witchy, fantastical powers. She is uh, the Alexander Skarsgård knowledgeable proverbial. about shrooms. Yeah. yeah, she's knowledgeable about shrooms. She is the proverbial sexy witch GF that we all wish and hope that we could have. Uh, <laughs> Slavic but, shroom GF. Yeah, Slavic shroom GF, of course. Um, but I think she's great in, in in pulling off all those moments and, you know, uh, pull, pulling through that emotion of, you know, we don't get a lot of, like, romantic setup. I like the scene between them in the forest, but she really pulls it off uh, in that scene on the boat that I was talking about earlier where we get that, like, uh, projection of, like, his future family tree with his two children. That's great. And then she has the thing where she, like, summons the winds of the north to, to carry her away to this new land. All very good stuff from Anya. Very good stuff from Skarsgård. Everyone's great. Um, we get uh, we get the proverbial scene that Timo was talking about uh, where that was sort of telegraphed a little bit to us by the marketing and um, I think it was Ethan Hawke talking about it where he said that uh, you know, yeah, me and Willem Dafoe uh, basically sat around mostly naked and howled at the moon for like 20 minutes. Everyone's like, I gotta see that scene. And you know what? It was worth it. It, it was very cool. It was very fun. It was very trippy, you know, seeing young Anne with, like, levitating above everyone. And uh, you, then you get uh, Willem Dafoe's skeleton head later in the film. I, I, I love those fantastical elements. And I think Eggers does a very good job of uh, integrating them into this film mm-hmm. in a way that isn't purely fantastical, but it, at the same time is not purely grounded. It's, it, it's this yeah. middle ground that plays with your perception. Um, also love Bjork showing up as a Valkyrie. That's fun. Come on, that's just I don't fun. know who Bjork is. Bjork was She's the a, she, uh, the the seer in the in the Roost, actually. In, oh, in the I thought she was the Val. I thought she was the Valkyrie. No, no, a different a different actor played the Valkyrie. Bjork uh, was yeah. the was the the shrouded woman who pro- uh, prophesied. Still cool. Yeah. Still very cool. Yeah, yeah, still yeah very with cool. the cool beads, like the three of them over, mm-hmm. like perfectly over her eyes. That yeah. Um, you talk about the Valkyrie. I really like the the like ending shot where he is yep. being he is being carried towards Valhalla, but he does we sure. never see him enter. We don't know if his ultimate goal, which is the ultimate goal of all Vikings, is to die in battle and enter into you know the pearly gates Valhalla, be be rewarded in the afterlife as a warrior, and you get to live us. You get I I mean I don't really remember what's so great about Valhalla besides it, it, it being where everyone wants to go or seven party time, man. You get to see all your relatives. You get to drink and shit. It's all, it's all great. Mead uncles. What more, you know, that'll be a great thing. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's the complete list of my dreams. Let me tell exactly. you that. Right now. <laughs> but the, the way that, you know, I think the, the Norse mythology plays like this really awesome background role. And in, in a way, gives a lot of motivations to characters is yeah. very, very gratifying, especially when, you know, not everyone knows a lot about more Norse mythology, but I feel like at least in, you know, white America, people kind of know what's up with Odin and with Loki and with all these other... Um, Thank you, MCU. Just yeah. want to point that out. I mean, yeah. let, let's be real. Yeah. That's where the yeah. connection comes from. Yeah. But I do think that what this film does very well is strike a balance between having the... Uh, religious quote-unquote undertones of of the norse mythology being just really integrated into this world people are saying odin they're saying freya they're doing these these rituals that involve 
shaking branches with blood on them or like these things that they're never like laid out this is what they're doing this is why they're doing it's like no this is just their culture they are taking they are taking uh part in the things that they do presumably every day every week every month and when they're praying to the wooden cutout of odin or they're saying odin they're saying phrase like no that's just it's how it is in this world mm-hmm. and, and 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 you know that fjolnir is a very religious man because he keeps putting things into the the idea that this is part of odin's plan and stuff like that when we we're viewing the, that that is not true like yes I, I think there's a really nice um integration of that that it doesn't feel like it's too forceful but it like feels really natural in the culture of the world yeah. one I think- tiny tidbit about that is i think it's cool freya sometimes referred to as a female god in the pantheon but the north the norsemen were not really super caring about that and so like all of the gods are represented in all gender proclivities and so in this film freya is referred to as a he god even though in a lot of mm-hmm. other instances it's a she god and but that's like totally fine like loki be transformed into whatever that's true. whatever he she loki they wants fucking, all the time loki be fucking horses sometimes and that's nuts yeah those that's the, them Nor- them norse gods be crazy Yes. Um, but yeah, I think that I think this this thing that we're sort of uh, wrapping up on that of the uh, movie? The, yeah. the integration of the fantastical and the real is something that Eggers does very well. And I was just curious as to if he had announced his next project. And of course, he has his long in development Nosferatu remake that yeah, I've uh, heard per- some troubling things that it's he maybe... recently he recently just said that probably won't happen, which is disappointing very because sad. I'd love to see it what he would he'd be able to do with that nearly 100 year old film so um and he's also apparently working on something called the night so who's yeah. to, who's to say what that oh, is sure letterbox looks like a helmet from dark souls so that because what and, and is it it's spelled with a k yeah yes, yes. it's about of a course night. well it but, could be uh, the night as in it could after sunset but it's not mm-hmm. but I, I really do hope for the for this man's entire filmography all of his films start with the please <gasps> please oh, Robert, something. listen to me the, the Nosferatu. The, the Nosferatu. <laughs> I mean, hey, we got yeah. the Batman, we got the Suicide Squad. It's not, it's not a new trend. <laughs> true, this is true. Um, but yeah, very excited for all that. We'll be talking. We'll no doubt be talking about those next Eggers films and uh, what other, whatever oh, else, years. uh, big tentpole films come out. We'll be talking about it all here on Backlog Banter. If you want to share your thoughts on the Northman, drop them in the comments below or join the Discord server. That link is in the description. Until then. We'll see you next time. Yes! Shakespeare is back! Sargon D's Shakespeare. Shakespeare.